Hey, this is John Leon Guerrero. Our guest today is Thomas Bacora. He spent 24 years working in, leading, and training the protective force in the CIA. That means he kept dignitaries, heads of state, agents, assets, you name it, safe in all of the hottest places in the world. All of them. If you can think of a spooky place that was a terrorist hotbed in the last quarter century, Tom was there. And he was there with the specific task of getting folks in, through, and out of there in one piece. He's now the author of the book Guardian, Life in the Crosshairs of the CIA's War on Terror, which is an historical memoir of his time in the protective operations. Tom is a badass of the highest caliber. He's got fascinating insights and lots of amazing stories. And you should read this book. It'll entertain you. It'll fascinate you. It's available at his website, thomas com, and we will put a link in the show notes. Speaking of badasses, we are promoting our favorite cause, Save the Brave. Check them out at savethebrave.org. And uh, the event that we're promoting is the Simon R. Litke Memorial Golf Tournament at the Temecula Creek Inn Golf Course on October 4th. Save the Brave is a certified 501c3 nonprofit organization dedicated to helping veterans cope with post-traumatic stress. You can register for the tournament at savethebrave.org slash event. And that link will be on our website, too. We also urge you to help us by rating and reviewing the Break It Down show, especially if you like us. Uh, You can do that on iTunes, Google Play, Spotify, or wherever you listen to find podcasts like ours. Do that for us, and we will keep getting you great guests. Like our special guest today, we know you're going to love him. Here's Thomas Pecora. Lions Rock Productions. This is Jay this Moore. Is Greg Proops. This is Jordan Harbinger. This is Dexter from The Offspring. This is Nathan this is East. Sebastian Younger. This is Rick Morales. This is Stuart Copeland. This is Mick Gillette. This is Andy Summers. Hey, this is Scott Baxter. This is Gabby Reese. This is Rob Bell. Hey, this is John Leon Guerrero. Hey, and this is Pete A. Turner. Hi, my name is Tom Pecora. I'm the author of a book called Guardian, Life in the Crosshairs of the CIA's War on Terror. It's a historical memoir of my 24 years in the CIA as a security officer protecting agency personnel in the war zones. And I'm here on the Break It Down Show. And now, the Break It Down Show with John Leon Guerrero and Pete A. Turner. Yeah, we've got Tom on the show and co-hosting with us. My good friend Jason Piccolo, who was fantastic. We swap guests all the time. And when I saw Tom's name, I looked up and said, wait, not the coach, the actual, the CIA guy? Yes, of course. I don't want the coach too, but in this case, we're talking to Tom, who worked for the CIA. And actually, you won the second highest award in the CIA. That's pretty damn good, man. Yeah, the award is called the Intelligence Star. And the alternate version is the the star that they chip into the wall if you perish during the act. So I'm happy to get the one where I'm alive. (laughs) Yeah, me too. And I don't know if you realize this, but I helped Mark Valley build a live drop into a podcast. So Mark and I are good friends. Oh, he's a great guy. I really uh, enjoyed being on his show. Yeah. Mark loves the spy game more than us spies. It's funny how much he's just so passionate about it and just wants to learn more about it. And, you know, he, he worked right there by Checkpoint Charlie and It's just neat to hear him talk about it. And in part, his inspiration to do Live Drop was partly my inspiration to do what I call spy versus spy episodes, where I bring folks like us who work in the work and we talk about the actual knit and grit of of what we do. And I'm going to consider you a spy. Maybe you don't because you worked on the security side. But the God's honest truth is, is you're trying not to be seen so you don't get shot and move fast. And guess what? That's what I try to do, too. Yeah, I I actually did work in the operational side. I was detailed over and I was hunting terrorists and providing support to the case officers when they were operating, doing pretty much about 30 percent to 70 percent of their work in terms of the clandestine activities, like getting cars and doing setting up surveillance detection routes and things like that supporting them so they could do their operations most more efficiently. I love talking about surveillance because it's such a, a mystifying part of the job that people don't talk about. And if you're comfortable talking about it, I'd like to dig in a little bit because there's surveillance, there's counter surveillance, and get this, everybody, there's people that counter the counter surveillance. The people that do surveillance, this is another odd fact that I didn't learn until decades into my career, are called surveillance, like TS, surveillance. And it's interesting because I've done private surveillance work. 
and I go to ask, like, well, what are we trying to do? Like, are we just following this guy? If they try to lose us, are we supposed to, you know, expose ourselves to keep up? Because you know how hard it is to follow someone. It's oh, fucking, yeah. <laughs> Not like possible. Hollywood. <laughs> we and this is this is my story, and then I'm going to shut up and let you guys talk about surveillance for a minute. So we were leaving an airport on a job following some people. Hey, this is Pete. Real quick, I just want to let you guys know we are proud to announce our official support of Save the Brave, a certified nonprofit 501c3 with a charter of helping veterans with post-traumatic stress. Here's how you can help. Go to savethebrave.com, click on the link on the website, and my recommendation is this. Subscribe. Give them 20 bucks a month. You've got subscriptions you can turn off right now that you're not using that are $20 a month. Swap that out. Get involved. Let's help these folks out. So we were leaving an airport on a job following some people, okay? And there is at least, I don't know, $30,000 a day worth of humans, cars, and everything else following some people. Mm-hmm. And we leave the airport, and the first car... You know, once we get out of the walking part of the surveillance. So literally like the third person who has the person that we're following drives out of the airport and we're next. And there's a rise that they go over and we're on the wrong side of the rise. And he hands off and it's a white car and there's two white cars. Oh. <laughs> like, Okay, car on the left. Let's go. You know, and within an instant, the rabbit was gone. <laughs> there it is. Not like Hollywood. No, <laughs> no. It sounds like my dope days when I used to work high or well, high intensity drug trafficking down in San Diego, try to track out people from there all over the country. So you guys may have done that overseas stuff, but it's it's not quite that easy in the domestic world as well. Oh, I, I imagine the tie-ins between surveillance in terms of working against other spies and then working against terrorism in the protection world. Uh, one of the big events that changed the way we looked at protection had to do with surveillance. There was an event back in, in the old days, in the uh, 70s and 80s, when there were the terrorists in uh, Europe were going after people. And they found out with an attack on a banker named Harehausen that even though he had the best armored car and a really good protection detail, they still killed him. And what was found was discovered by examining that uh, attack is that the surveillance was the weak point in the, in the terrorist methodology. And from that moment on, we started looking at protection with a very strong focus on finding the surveillance and then working backwards. Yeah. How does one counter surveillance then? How, I mean, how do you do that? Well, it, you, know, you mentioned the terminology and, it, and different units use different things. At the CIA, we developed an actual counter surveillance unit that worked on the director's protection detail. And I was part of that original unit. And what we were doing is you have to understand the attack cycle of the terrorist. And, and it's anywhere between seven and nine steps, depending on who you're talking to. But one of the critical parts is they, before they can attack you, they have to find out information about you. And in most cases, at, at some point, they're going to have to be within visual range. And at that point, what you're looking for is the, the signature of a surveillance. And if you're, for example, the, on the detail, the protection detail, and the surveillance are watching you, you're being surveilled so you are trying to recognize surveillance. If you are the next level back, in other words, you're looking for the surveillance on your protectee, you are counter surveillance. Yes. So there's multiple levels. And so you, you've got this who's watching who yeah. and looking at who's back. And it becomes, it becomes difficult because the playing field only uh, allows you certain observation points. And if you're not careful, you're going to end up in one of the observation points sitting next to the bad guy yes, and that won't work. And that's one thing you learn with uh, surveillance is there's just not enough room when you have layer upon layer of the circle, you know, each wave of the circle. So, yeah, man. Um, so you, you know, you and I talked a little bit before the show, we talked a, a bit before now you keep jumping around all over the world. And so now you got to pick up different surveillance tactics, different oh, yeah. worlds. What is that like? Oh, that's challenging. And when I would move to a new location, the first thing I would have to do is learn the area. And that's eight hours a day or more for the first week, week and a half to to learn the routes, to learn the areas that people frequent that we're protecting. And then we're also having to pick up on the culture and the dress 
and the way they operate their cars, you're picking up all the, the facts that you're going to need so that you can blend in. And you're also looking for your perch, your places where you can observe the areas where the most likely surveillance point is going to be. For example, if there's a park across the street from one of our agency person's houses, we can't be in that park with them. That's where the bad guys are going to be. We're going to have to be in a location where we can observe likely spots in the park, but in areas where they won't necessarily be looking for us to watch them. So we're, we, we want to uh, look at the back of their neck. That's kind of the, uh, the, the methodology. Yeah, it's a funny game of who's going to sit where, you know, and then like you're going to do this for an unknown number of hours and you're going to sit there and you have to provision for going to the bathroom, eating. And sometimes you work in teams if you're afforded that luxury. Sometimes you're not, though. And so wherever your perch is, is also part sustainability. Right, Tom? Like, yes. you, like you can't just stand on the corner by the train station with the newspaper all day. At some no. point, <laughs> that doesn't work. No. At some point, you got to get on the train. <laughs> right. Yes. Yeah. You've got to factor in your activities so that they don't give away the fact that you're watching. For example, when your protectee leaves, you can't wait five minutes and then leave, too, because right. that, that's correlation. You're correlating. So you've got to factor in. How are you going to go to the bathroom and where are you going to eat and how are you going to switch off with your teammates? How do you do your communication, especially in places where they don't allow radios? So right. it gets very complicated. It's a real challenge. Not to be graphic, but planning your bathroom break. That's a big one. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> it's yeah. called the uh, detergent bottles. Right? I found to be the best if you guys want to know. <laughs> so one of the things that's funny about surveillance is as you're going around, they have a thing, at least in the military, we call it the heat steak. And uh, uh, your heat states is uh, um, how hot you are in terms of like how long you've been in an area. Have you changed your outfit and that kind of thing? And so we would call that a polish. And so you pol and all these things aren't classified. These things are known. What happens when you do training in D.C.? D.C. is hot and muggy. You're running around. You're changing clothes in a van. And it's in no way in no way clandestine. It's just a circus <laughs> of people trying to go down one way streets and the rabbit walking across the mall and you're just dripping with sweat and you're taking, you know, you would take sweaty clothes off and put them onto a sweaty body and ah, oh, it's, it's horrible. So how does that compare with, I always felt like the op tempo when we trained in DC was entirely too high for what reality was. How does that actually compare? Like in real life, when you're sitting there because I, I know like in real life when I've done actual surveillance, 90% of the time you're just sitting there waiting for something to happen or you're driving in a line of cars, you know, with, with no, no responsibility other than to be a car in line and move up in time, which could be hours on the same road. Hurry up and wait. Yeah. One story that I tell in my book is about a surveillance operation when I was in Khartoum and Khartoum is a desert place and Temperatures get up to 135 degrees. And I ended up on the rooftop of a building surveilling some Holy bad shit. guys in a restaurant. And luckily I was in this, they had built a little, like a, like a little closet and it had an air conditioner, but you could imagine how it wasn't keeping up with the heat. And so I was just one dripping mess. And to keep my concentration on this small lens uh, that I was looking through, which was on the back end of a two foot long, a gigantic ex extended telephoto lens. So I'm, I'm watching and with one eye and trying to, to keep concentration. And uh, I found that what I ended up doing was eating nasty gummy bear, actually they were called gummy worms, just to get the, keep the sugar level up high enough so that I could keep in the job. It was miserable. Miserable. I did that for a couple of weeks straight. Well, you know, you're basically a sniper. A lot of people don't realize that, that you're just gathering intelligence. You're looking for a split second to gather it and, and it, you know, to make sure your, uh, your package is good. So, I mean, you're essentially sitting there like a sniper. So, I mean, it's a tough job, man. Oh, yeah. Uh, no glory there. <laughs> yeah. Now, and when people say, you know, they only, and you know, I've had a lot of contact with secret service. I've done protection details, done surveillance. And when you talk about a protection, it's not just protection. It's the whole thing. It's you're basically doing intelligence gathering. 
you're doing protection, you're doing a million different things. You're basically, like you said, doing case officer stuff. You're gathering. You're absolutely right. That If your subject's day is a 12-hour day, you've got a 16-hour day. You know, because you're starting before them, you're waiting on them to get up. And like you said, Tom, when they leave, you're like, well, I've got a little while to sit here still. That's it. Then you have to write reports. Yeah, nothing's done until the paperwork's finished. Right. Yeah, the little known uh, write up the uh, the report. And oh, by the way, that's got to get uploaded. And, you know, your supervisor is going to talk to you and you got mandatory training and mandatory meetings. So, yeah, your days are your days and weeks turned into like a blur, I'm imagine. Yeah, they, I, I will say I felt for the case officers because they did do a lot more paperwork. We used to uh, we used to say that if 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 we if you made a TV program about the, the I was with the counterterrorism unit, the counterterrorism unit would be 50 minutes of action and 10 minutes of writing. And the case officer would be 10 minutes of action and 50 minutes of writing. So totally different jobs. I enjoyed being on the street a lot more than having to work in the office. And then the other thing that happens that's crazy is if the subject of the surveillance is aware or has strong personal counter surveillance techniques, I'm trying to describe this carefully, that also is a nightmare. You know, like let's say that uh, I'm the person everybody's following and I am walking in and out of stores. I'm doing all of the things. I'm having conversations with 10 different people every hour. Everybody following me is losing their minds. You can probably, if you paid attention, you could probably watch behind me and watch the groans and the misery <laughs> as I meet the 15th person in an hour. Every single person, because somebody you have to kind of peel off and account for in some way or get a picture of or to a timestamp and describe this. Pr- oh, my God. It's just driving me. Yes. It's driving me crazy thinking about what I would do if I, if I knew I was being followed. Absolutely. And there's a strange phenomenon that happens when you sit and watch an area long enough, you see some very strange stuff that normally you wouldn't see because you're about your business and you're moving along and you've got your mind on other things. And when you see these strange things, you've got you to figure out what they are. Yeah. And so some investigation has to go into it. And so often, in, in most cases, it's just some weird thing happening in the environment that has nothing to do with your protectee. But it still has to be run down. And sometimes you get some pretty strange stories. You find out people are, are out on their husbands or people are, are involved in drug deals or something strange is going on in the neighborhood, but it has nothing to do with your protectee. Yeah, that's true. The other funny thing is people get lost. People forget things. They double back because, you know, whatever, or they get inspired at the last second because they want fucking ice cream. And you know how we are. We're all like, why does he want ice cream? What's going on? No, he just wants a piece of ice cream, you know? Is it a drop? What's going on? (laughs) Someone stay at the Circle K and sweep that place. Yeah. (laughs) Uh, Who's got the trash? (laughs) Oh, trash detail. Oh, gosh. Well, the other thing I wanted to bring up, too, was the, the teamwork, too. You know, you're talking solo operation and how you do it. But if you don't have the right team, man, you are you're kind of SOL. So you have to make sure they're all up to speed as well. Yes, you don't always get to choose your, you know, the quality of your teammates. We, uh, I believe, out uh, more pertinent information. But we had somebody that had a nasty habit of forgetting where they left the rental car. <laughs> Oh, man. (laughs) Multiple times we had to end up scouring the city to try to find this rental car. That can really affect your uh, your performance. I have a funny surveillance story, and I'm going to tell it. So I was doing a private surveillance job, you know, just like a, like $50 an hour, no big deal. You're going to sit there all night. And we have this guy, and we just don't want him to flee the country. It was a court case, right? Nothing classified. And so he lived in a subdivision that had one way in, one way out. Everybody's like a surveillance expert. You know, everybody's like, I know how to do surveillance. It's it's all a bunch of cocksure people. So all these guys are talking about where they were going to be, and they all wanted to be on the subject. And I'm like, that's fantastic. All of you guys go wherever you want to go. Bunch up all over him. <laughs> I'm going to go out of the subdivision and to the left down a quarter mile because if he goes left, he'll never know I'm following him. So I just posted up in a neighborhood and started sleeping. 
you know, because there's <laughs> nothing else. Conserving your were, energy. Yeah, they were also fired up. Turns out that my buddy works for the 911 response part of the police department in the area where you're in. So we were already called in to say we were going to be in the area, which is what you do for law enforcement. Say, hey, we're doing some surveillance, blah, blah, blah. They don't care as long as they know about it. But I let him know. I'm like, hey, I'm in your area and I'm doing surveillance. He's like, are you in that black truck? And I'm like, yeah, I'm in a black truck. It's like, someone already called and reported you. And I'm like, yeah, I don't care about that. I'm nowhere near my subject. Of course, they called because there's a dude sitting in a neighborhood in his car, <laughs> you know, for more than 20 minutes, you know, in front of someone's. Yeah, of course. And he's like, cool. Well, I'm going to bring you some tacos. And I'm like, sweet. I love tacos. And I'm like, hey, by the way, my really good friend and a guy we grew up with, so he knows him too. My really good friend Jeff is sitting on the subject's house. And he's like, well, where is the house? And I said, oh, it's this address at this place. He's like, my best friend just moved in right next door. I swear to God, I was at his house yesterday unpacking boxes. And I'm like, take Jeff tacos right there while he's sitting on the subject. <laughs> <laughs> and so Jeff has no idea I'm talking to my buddy Brian. And so Brian comes over, hangs out with me. We have some tacos. He gets out and leaves and goes. He walks right up to Jeff's car, knocks on the windows, hands him a box of tacos. And Jeff is just like, what the fuck? Because he hasn't seen this guy in 20 years. This guy just brought me tacos. That's Brian Whitney. And then he walks towards the subject house, cuts across his grass and goes into his friend's house. How great is that? <laughs> Flew his mind. Yeah, Totally. What kind of funny stories? You must have something good like that. Oh, the crazy situations I end up in because a lot of times I had to work solo and I'd be in some really bad places by myself. I remember one time we were waiting on a on a meeting in a nightclub area of Manila. And unfortunately, traffic is, was so bad back then. You know, traffic jams would cause you to be two, three hours late. So trying to find a parking spot, you'd have to place your car maybe six hours in advance. And I ended up stuck in this car with no air con running, just a, a crack in the window. It ended up with a three hour while I watched everybody going by me partying while I just sweat a pool on that car seat. This is so much fun. The boredom level is off the charts. My dad had a saying for that. He said, success is the management of boredom. Yeah. And in surveillance work, that is, that's the mantra. You know, I'm reading your book now. I'm just picturing you wrestling, you know, college, and then picturing you later on, like, sweating your ass off in a, in a closet somewhere. And I'm like, Do you, did you think your career would end up there? Never in a million years. I had no idea what I was getting myself into. <laughs> Every new job brought a whole new world and a new interesting people. That part I've enjoyed. I've worked with a lot of uh, different foreign groups and, of course, lots of people within the U.S. government. And that's been one of the highlights, actually, in meeting all, all these people and having good times. Yeah, let's pay the bills a little bit here. Everybody, this is Tom Pecora. You got to get his book. It's so awesome. It's called Guardian, Life in the Crosshairs of the CIA War on Terror. Hey, this is P.A. Turner from Lions Rock Productions. We create podcasts around here. And if you, your brand, or your company want to figure out how to do a podcast, just talk to me. I'll give you the advice on the right gear, the best plan, and show you how to take a podcast that makes sense for you, that's sustainable, that's scalable, and fun. Hit me up at Pete at BreakItDownShow.com. Let me help. I want to hear about it. Yeah, let's pay the bills a little bit here. Everybody, this is Tom Pecora. You got to get his book. It's so awesome. It's called Guardian, Life in the crosshairs of the CIA war on terror. And what Tom is describing is just like all of the work that goes into doing the work of a, of a CIA team that's trying to find Al Qaeda or whatever it's going to be like. It's not just constantly a pursuit of the bad guy. It's a lot of standing around, sweating your ass off in a car because you can't run the engine any longer. You're going to run out of gas. All these crazy things that go into trying to manage these things. Oh, and by the way, He's been in, what, Tom, over 20 countries, I would guess? Uh, for 50. 50. <laughs> 50 countries. So your tolerance for ambiguity must be peaked out at the very top. Like, you can tolerate a lot of, a lot of uncertainty. To the point where I was ready to go to any country at any moment and get in the car and spend the next week learning the roads, and I would know it better than most of the locals. And it's just that I could operate. Yeah, it was always a challenge. Always a challenge, but fun. I mean, I, I love traveling and I, and I like to see the different cultures and I've met so, some really nice people. I've been to some places I'd never want to go again. 
<laughs> from Mad Max Somalia to crazy times in Haiti to absolutely great times in Bolivia. And it's the people who made the difference. Yeah. That's one thing I got to give props to the book too, because the book is broken down into like timeline. So it's very easy to follow you. So you're not just jumping all over the world and everything. So it's, it's easy to track your life as you're going and just seeing the things that you had to go to get into the agency. It's just, it really is an unprecedented book because you've heard all the books about spy versus spy. You've read all the spy, the case officer books, but this is just a different precedent. That's what I liked about it. It took me three years to get through the publication review board, and I won't go into the, the excruciating <laughs> details that that took. It was, a, it was a battle royal, but I was able to get details that have never really been talked about. Uh, the protection unit that was clandestine up until basically the Benghazi event in 2012 when the, um, the annex team saved the lives of the State Department personnel. So I got a chance to, to – I was kind of the unit historian, and I got a chance to, to actually – document for the public the story of a unit that's been highly successful but totally clandestine from basically 1990 all the way up until 2012. So when you take this body of work and you try to organize it obviously yeah getting it by all of the people that have to approve the uh, tactics and techniques and stories exposed but what about the timeline thing that's interesting oh and I should say by the way for sure, check out Mark Valley's episode of Live Drop with Tom and also Jason Piccolo's episode. We're not going to cover a lot of the background stuff because these guys have done such a great job already in that. That's why we're sort of focusing on the tradecraft end of it. But the actual writing of the book, the t I mean, to to describe, you can go linear, but I don't know if that serves what you're trying to do because there's so much plurality in all of these things. So how did you come up with the structure? Well, it kind of just grew when I started to, to hash out certain key events. I wanted to match them to major terrorist events that I was working to interesting things that were going on in the world. And it just, it just seemed to, to come together. And that's why I say it's, it, it parallels the terrorism thing, paralleled my whole career. I seem to be, my writers like to say I was, uh, I had two writers that helped me uh, organize it. And that's, I give them props for that. They kept me on the line so that I didn't jump around and, and confuse the, re the readers. There were so many areas where I was just the forced gump of, of security from the time that I was in the security duty office and we had an attack on CIA headquarters in 93 to ending up going against bin Laden's guys in Mogadishu to all actually working against bin Laden in Khartoum. And then later on in Pakistan. So there was this parallel line of, of life that just happened. It turned out it, it worked well for a book. You know, I said it is a different timeline. It's not like your life. It's more outside events that, that took you along the way. As you go to these different places, Mogadishu, Khartoum, and all that stuff, are there certain things culturally that you bring with you? Like, do you say, Khartoum? I can't think of his name from Godfather, but... Like, you know, are there those things that just kind of stick with you as you travel along and you're like this, you know, has no reference to anybody else here. You pick up stuff and there's a lot of language that comes with some of the activities that who you work with. And like, you know, we call it the Moog, you know, the, the Moog. And then working in certain parts of Asia, I would pick up terminology like I would start to use the language that is local. For example, we say the Bataan Death March, which is a famous World War II death march by the Japanese of the POWs. Well, in the Philippines, they call it Bataan. So you pick up that and you start using, you know, language and then people in America go, what? What are you talking about? <laughs> <laughs> yes. There's always language. I, I remember when I talk about the weirdness of the language and the, the different units, I was detailed to the NRO, the National Reconnaissance Office, to be director of security for their largest mission ground station. And I, I was getting prepared to go out to the site. And somebody said, oh, it'll take you about six months for the language. And I said, no, no, this is a domestic assignment. And he looked at me and he, and he said, it's going to take you six months for the language. And he was right. The acronyms were totally different. And I had to recalibrate my head. Your internal lexicon, right? That's it. Yeah, I wish I would have written it down. I had like a, like a paragraph that I could say in all army speak was all acronyms. And you throw in a couple of who was in there and that kind of thing. And 
anybody in a staff room would understand everything I said, and it would be the most mundane conversation, but it would sound like absolute gibberish if I was to just ramble it off. I, I should have written it down because it was so good, but, you know, like things like VBID or, you know, all oh. these different things that exist, like that we all just talk fast with it. it Everybody is, uh, used to call it just a car bomb. Now it's yeah. a, and then if it's a suicide mm-hmm. car bomb, it's an S-V-B-I-E-D. Yes. What a mouthful. Yes. And if they have a vest on, it's an S vest. I mean, it's just. Yep. <laughs> yeah. And then I, I like to always put like the um, the rocket, like the rockets that they wanted to launch. Like, what if they put that rocket in a car with a person? It's like a, you know, rocket propelled <laughs> SVBID murder bomber. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. It's, it's, it, it gets, and it gets weirder the more you go into the field because then people decide that. You're going to use radios, right? So now you're going to be on a call sign. Yeah. So mm-hmm. next thing you know, you're calling everybody by their call sign. Right. And years later, you realize that you don't remember their real first name. <laughs> so you'll see them in the, at the airport. I remember when Kofor Black, I worked for in Khartoum. And then later on, he was the head of CTC, the Counterterrorism Center. And then later on, he was with the State Department. It was the, the ambassador for counterterrorism. He saw me in an airport going to a, to a flight. And he yells out, hey, snake, oh, which God. was one of my call signs. Just the craziness of that, that becomes a lifestyle. I had a weird, weird call sign thing. So I was artillery in the 90s. And I, was, I was attached to a unit called 529. I get in a border patrol. My nomenclature is Bravo 529. I become a special agent. My call sign is 529. And because we didn't come up with like fancy, like top gun names. <laughs> we were like just literally a number. So that's how we knew everybody by their number. And I would, oh man, you know how much easier it would be if I was like a snake or if I was like the wolfhound or something? You know, it became very complicated in Baghdad when I was there 04 to 05. We would give people or let them choose a call sign, but we had so many people going through and we we had to keep track of all the call signs and make sure that nobody was uh, uh, using the same one or similar. Like I was, it used to be called, you know, snake, snake was taken. So I ended up with uh, slinger which was a little, a little personal joke because it means short for gunslinger. But I had people who wanted to have some really nasty names. And we, you know, we one guy kept using you know, the wrong terms. And finally we said, hey, you get one more shot. He blew it. And he was Fuzzy Bunny. Oh. Fuzzy, he was a protection <laughs> guy. So he'd come up on the radio and everybody would howl. Fuzzy Bunny, Fuzzy Bunny. <laughs> so, yeah. We had a guy. So I was already on the team. And he showed up, and he was also a Pete. And so everyone in the team was like, hey, uh, you can't be Pete. There's too many of you. So you have to be something else. Do you have a nickname? And he said, oh, well, my friends call me Tripod. Oh, okay. <laughs> Whip it out. Let's see that fat fucker. And he's like, oh, well, I'm, 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 I'm. Like, now your name is Nipple Dick. Because anybody <laughs> oh. who's really a Tripod, and that became his name. He became either... Big gay walrus or nipple dick because he <laughs> he didn't understand the rules of the game. You know? nope. <laughs> yeah, I, I want to get a little bit back into the career thing. 50 different mm-hmm. countries. When you got an assignment, how much relief was there if it was a place that you were comfortable with or that you were like, I mean, you say Bolivia. I, I think, yeah, that's pretty good. But you say Mogadishu or Djibouti or Somalia. I think, oh, fuck, this is going to suck. How, how yeah. much of that goes into your, it doesn't matter where you go. Your job is going to be the same. It's just the conditions you have to work in. Yes. Yeah, so there's, there's differences. Like when I was uh, working on the protection side, we would do usually six week deployments because that uh, for, for rotational purposes. And also at a, after about six weeks, your, your performance starts to go down. And what we were able to, to, to work at, so we would, we would do six weeks and then we would go back. And we would uh, do a, a section of training and then the, some time off. And then you go, you rotate back in. When I was doing the counterterrorism unit, we would do a similar thing, usually about a six week deployment. But when I was going, working in the war zones in a lot of places, uh, they were one year tours and you would have usually two, uh, two long, two week to three week breaks during that one year. And usually we try to do it at the four month mark because what we've noticed is about the four-month mark, you start to exhibit some symptoms of stress. 
And for some people, it actually starts to lead more towards PTS. Sure. And it was, that was a major factor for us, uh, especially in, in my position as the head of security when I was in Iraq and other locations. That was one of the things that I was watching for closely because different positions, these people would get into some very stressful moments uh, on a regular basis. And that, that meant that their, their time in country probably more toward a three-month break than a four. Yeah, that rotational op cycle is really, it's tough. And, and and like you, I did a lot of my work solo. I might be with a unit, but my work, my job was was really my work. So if there was operational stuff to do, I had to do it. If there were reports to write, I had to do it. I had to be fit to go out and do the patrol the next day. I had to do all of it. And in the moment, it's fine. You just work really long. A 16-hour day is an easy day, you know, yeah. but when you when you do stop your brain at least my brain worked in a totally different way you know being keyed up all the time i ran on caffeine and adrenaline and cortisol it's taken a long time for me to get reality back you know well that's one thing you need to think about too is the adrenaline factor you know i'm having it we we all have it you know the three of us had a lot of adrenaline at a certain type of point in our life and now kind of being in this point where we're kind of doing podcasts and books and <laughs> it's, it's a different life. And that's kind of, where do you get that adrenaline back? It's almost like a drug. Yeah. It's, uh, it, it was going from 60 miles an hour down, dropping down to, to two and yeah. going, Whoa, it's just a whole different world. Yeah. One of the things I've noticed talking with other people who are have similar backgrounds like us is when you tire or you leave the job, it's it's a it's a huge difference. We are very institutionalized, uh, a lot more so than we would ever believe. <laughs> and the uh, coming to grips with that and learning to to have um, to deal with that is is a struggle. And that's when a lot of times people things come out of the closet that that we're hiding. And um, for for a lot of us, uh, the the delayed stress things come out and because you're no longer, you're no longer in the job and you don't have to function. So all of a sudden now, you, you know, your subconscious says, well, uh, <laughs> you know, you're not on a mission now, so I can act up. Yeah. And uh, you know, those car washes, you can't go in those anymore. Yeah. You know, uh, that's one of the, you still need to find that brotherhood or sisterhood. You need that, that close contact with people of similar backgrounds. And that's why kind of these, these, I, I could sure peek can attest to it. These podcasts and talking to like low any people is almost therapeutic. You know, writing a book is therapeutic. Doing this yeah. is therapeutic because, you know, I'm in law enforcement, been in law enforcement almost 20 years now, you know, minus all the military stuff. And, you know, so many cops, when they're done two years later, they're suicidal or they're alcoholic or a drug addict because they kind of lose out. I'm not saying all cops, but a lot of them, um, they lose out on their brotherhood and sister. They don't have anybody to connect to. Yeah. And people who have not had our similar experiences, they really can't relate. I mean, how do you talk about a war zone or a car bomb to people who've, who, who fireworks at a, at a 4th of July is the, lo- the loudest bang they've ever heard? And, you know, that's one thing your, your book touches on a lot of areas that you've, you've been close to death, how do you go from 60 to two miles an hour? I mean, that's, that's one thing. And, you know, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm by I'm bypassing, you know, Pete right now, because I love to talk tradecraft too, but I'm always about stress and how we deal with it. So, I mean, I just, I look at you guys and I'm like, there's information to be gained here for all of us. Well, I, I, I was always into uh, fitness. And uh, so I, I became a bit of a gym rat when I could, especially when I'm at headquarters. Uh, you know, it's, I, I feel like I'm the gerbil on the wheel, man. I just, I just hit that wheel harder, but dealing with the stress is, is a huge factor, especially if you end up doing back to back to backs. Like I was, I was, I hit every war zone from 93 on until I, on, until 2013. And he hit something in the head. I, I, I finally realized I didn't know how many cat lives I had left. Right. And I got to the point where risk taking was not, I, I became very, well, I was in jobs where I had to be more conservative and I was, I was more responsible for other people. So I had to be more cognizant of risk and, and doing everything I could to do more on risk management. Yeah. That risk thing, man, that resonates with me like crazy because gosh, if nine lives is the number and that's the joke, double that. Right. I mean, it's so I I've been hit by a tank. Well, you're not supposed to survive getting hit by a tank. 
<laughs> that tank hit a car behind us. It was just hitting cars. So you have a tank out, and these are our people on our camp. Oh people, yeah, you know mortars. I was uh, running one day in Iraq, and um, you know the assholes shot a uh, an empty mortar shell or a rocket or something. And I'm just running down the road. I didn't run a whole lot because of these kinds of things, but that shell just went dink, 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 dink down the street by me. And I'm like, what a bunch of fucking dicks. They're just doing that. Like that could have hit me assholes. You know, <laughs> those things stack up and you, you know, like I remember the last time someone truly tried to kill a patrol that I was on, I happened to not be on that patrol, but the bomb, what was left of it came back because it had blown up and it blew up the uh, chief of police in Afghanistan where I was. And I'm, I just looked and like there's motorcycle engine parts in this thing. And I'm like, man, I really got to find a better line of work. You know? Yeah. There comes a point where you got, you, you look at it and you go, ah, uh, and, and there's, there's ways of looking. I, I like to look at it as there's other things I can do. Yeah. I got more and more involved in training and, and trying to, tr- to get our, our security personnel better prepared for the war zones because we, we turned into a, an organization that was living in the war zones. I mean, we've been in them, um, for how many, how many, a decade. That was one of the things that helped me. But then I, I realized at a certain point that it was time to do something different. And that took some real thought, but I said, okay, it's, it's time to do something drastically different and I'm, I'm leaving. So I left at 50, I got out early. While I miss it, I miss the guys, I miss the mission. I miss being on a mission, but I don't miss the stress. I don't miss the near, the near misses. Well, it's a lessons learned factor, you know, now you could use your 20 something, 30, 24 years worth of experience and give that back. And like I was saying before, is like your book is shining a light on something nobody knows about. All he knows, the only thing I know about protection ops for uh, the agency was what I learned in um, 13 hours. I don't know about the actual bona fide government employees that went on later on to, you know, mentor and train contractors and everything, but that we need to know this stuff. You are a living historian. So, I mean, that's your next mission. That's what yeah, I was lucky that I was a pack rat and I collected and I was really interested. And so when I left in 2013, I gave all my records back to the unit, but there wasn't anybody who had the continuity that I had. And 13 hours was the reason why I wrote the book because the guys that wrote that were, were contractors and they didn't understand the, the history. They thought it started in nine, after 9-11. And we had actually started, and it, the, the genesis was, it was ni- uh, 1990. So I wanted to kind of get that story out. And also, there were a lot of people who did a lot of work in a lot of dangerous places, and they got no credit. I mean, nobody knew that they worked it. And I thought there's a lot of people who, who would love to have this story come out. So this one's for, for the guys. You know, we, had, we had a couple ladies in there, but uh, <laughs> it, was, it was mostly guys working. And uh, it was staff, all staff up until uh, basically 9-11. Well, you know, you bring up a few good points there is because the historian. Now, I was attached to Special Ops Command when I was in Iraq in 06. And there was a historian that came around. And I'm like, what does this guy want? I'm like, what does he care what I do? <laughs> and then one of my friends is, was a historian for the Air Force. So I'm like, you know what? You need a record. You need a bona fide record. You can't trust the media or some other narrative you need someone that's just going to gather facts and become a bona fide historian so that's that's why i really dig your book big fan i'm not gonna lie yeah that book is called guardian life in the crosshairs of the cia war on terror by tom pecora if you can definitely connect with tom on linkedin he's got a website coming tom what's your website address it's thomas dash Pecora.org. Okay. Jason said these stories are important because of the, I got, I want to get into the 13 hours thing, but we just don't have time left in this episode mm-hmm. because that is such an important story. And when you look at like, you're often out as a solo guy, right? And, and I'm positive that that job is billeted for more than one person, but there's just, there are too many jobs in too many places for not enough people. And so you have to, at sometimes the government has to hire in temporary capacity. So you get like the guys from 13 hours and only certain guys can do that job. I mean, there's, there's plenty of Intel jobs where you can sit in your chair and do nothing all day and everybody's stoked. But in a job like that, in in a place where most in most of the world, nothing happened on that day, you Mm -hmm. know, but in that one place, it did happen. That, that, that could have happened in any number of other countries on that day. 
you just Absolutely. don't know. You can't account for all of it. So when, when we're rough on President Obama and Secretary Clinton, understand that you tell me, Tom, there is no way to cover all of those shortfalls. There's just not, you know, and unfortunately, folks like us that go out and do hard things in hard places, sometimes it's just the numbers are not in line with you that day and you you pay the price. One of the things that we tell the, the new protections officers is that there's only uh, one way to get out of this basically blameless, and that's for it not to happen on your watch. Yeah. And it just, that's the only realistic way. And when something happens, you've got to have in the back of your head, you know, that they're going to Monday morning quarterback and things probably not going to look good, but you've got to be confident enough in what you did. And it's a roll of the dice. Yeah. Well, shoot, man, I appreciate you coming on. I would love to have you come back on and talk more about this stuff. I definitely want to get a copy of the book and read that. Everybody should definitely buy it. And look, here's the deal. When you buy the books on Amazon, buy the book and spend 30 seconds rating and reviewing it. Give him five stars. Give him a review because that's going to allow people to find Tom's fantastic book. I've not read it, and I'm going to tell you right now, on the strength of this guy's pedigree, this is a book you're going to enjoy. Jason is reading it. He's loving it buy this book and you're going to be like, I never knew these things about how we do these things overseas. And then we'll have Tom come back on and we'll ask him a bunch more questions about it. But Tom, seriously, thank you so much for coming on. Thank you for coming on Mark's show and Jason's show. And and just thank you for all the things you've done for this country. Because in case you didn't know, that shit ain't easy, man. You you did a lot of hard (laughs) stuff. Oh, it's more of a vocation than a been a job but i appreciate it and uh, and you guys with your background uh, your and the service you did for the country i appreciate it and thanks for being podcasters podcast hosts appreciate that thank you tom yeah thanks tom that's great